So Joe, you do a fair amount of work with high risk, high volume prostate cancer, especially with nodal disease, obviously not somebody with, with, with bony metastasis. Tell us a little bit about your experience in terms of how you got a patient maybe with high volume, high grade disease, positive localized nodes in the pelvis. How does some of this data play into your particular practice in your clinic? So in, up until this stampede trial, which is basically today, uh, in our clinic, because of the Gatug trial showing no superiority, node positive disease, we, we would use hormones and radiation, but we would not give them chemotherapy up to this point. I guess the question back to the oncologist would be now with this data, would you extrapolate to node positive disease? And if so, how many nodes would it have to be a, a certain uh, uh, criteria? Uh, the problem is, is that in those patients who are non-metastatic, there's a delay in disease progression, but it's not powered well enough to show a survival benefit. So what I think we really need is more confirmatory evidence that, that this actually is showing a survival benefit. And there are several trials that are out there that may help us extrapolate. They may not exactly fit. There's an RTOG trial that is looking at radiation along with docetaxel. Uh, there's the PUNCH trial that uh, James Eastham is uh, leading, which is docetaxel followed by radical prostatectomy versus radical prostatectomy. And the trial that I think sort of fallen off the radar that um, unfortunately uh, did not uh, follow their patients through to, to progression uh, was the, uh, the TAX 3503 trial which took patients who had failed prostatectomy, rising PSA, and randomized them to 18 months of hormones plus docetaxel versus hormones alone. I think that that trial is so crucial to this whole um, treatment schema because that's a very commonly observed group of patients who may actually benefit by getting, uh, getting chemotherapy early. And in fact, what it may actually do is, is delay the time to reinstitution of hormone therapy. And there are, you know, hormone therapy, as we all know, is not, not a benign treatment. Uh, and the longer we can keep our patients off that, the better. But would I give this to somebody who's non-metastatic, with a, either with or without a rising PSA? Probably not at this point, because I don't think that there's enough evidence to tell me that, that, uh, that, that we should go ahead and do that. Perhaps Tia can. No, I mean, I completely agree. Um, I, if you're asking me to predict the future, do I think it will have a role? I, yes, but I don't usually do that kind of thing with the patients, especially with chemo, since, you know, in all these trials, there was at least one treatment-related death. You certainly don't want to, you know, endanger patients with non-metastatic disease. You know, Raul, the uh, PUNCH trial Dan alluded to, uh, Jim Easton is running, uh, we're pretty involved in, Jim tells me I'm the second highest accruer, so I've put uh, uh, about 55, 60 patients into that trial. I'm, first of all, quite impressed with how readily patients in our area are willing to go into a trial which gives them five months of chemotherapy and engine deprivation followed by surgery, suppose going straight to surgery. Uh, and so the, the interest of patients has surprised me uh, in a positive way. Uh, but also from a surgical standpoint, Joe, I find that uh, I like the patients uh, that are, are, are interested in nerve sparing still. So with six months of angine deprivation, their function should return. Uh, but we knew from the, the neoadjuvant angine deprivation prior to surgery, we, we decreased positive surgical margins about 25%, even though it wasn't a survival benefit. But in the context of the, doing these uh, high-risk patients, I'm, I'm more interested in doing nerve sparing in the treatment arm because I think we might have a better uh, uh, result with regard to lower positive surgical margin rates as well. So just from a small standpoint on the surgical aspect, I think it can make some sense and be potentially of some benefit. What, what, what was the inclusion criteria in terms of Gleason? Eight or above. So it had to be... Or you can, use the, you can use the Catan nomogram. They have to achieve a score, uh, and you can hit that score with some sevens if the PSA is high enough, the volume of the cores, uh, and uh, uh, so it is possible the 4-3 or occasionally a high volume 3-4 could hit it too. You have to have, I believe it was a less than, uh, I forget the exact 10-year uh, recurrence rate that you had to hit to qualify. So, so